Fritch from Heart Connected. And I am the president and founder of Hearts Connected, and I am beyond excited about today. Um, I'm going to give you just a little bit of background, do a couple intro slides, and then we will dive right in. So like I said, I am Dee Dee. I am the founder and president of Hearts Connected. Um, I am a pediatric nurse of 33 years and started Hearts Connected about two years ago. Um, I'm sure you've been on our website, so please, you know, take a look. Um, the, the more you know, the more you share, the more patients and children and families we can help. So I'm not going to give you a sales pitch. You know what we do, but you are instrumental to what we do and into growing this community of child life specialists and, and growing our support in patients and families in the community. So um, you see on our slide a little bit about what we do, but please feel free to check out our social pages and our web page um, when you have referrals. And then I want to share about our next event, um, which I am equally as excited about today as I am this next event. Um, if you don't know, we do prioritizing the knee every other month, and we've been doing that for about a year, and our attendance has grown and grown and grown. Um, as I had said earlier, we now have over 200 registrants for this event um, for today, so we're very excited about that because that means we are supporting you, the industry, um, child life specialist, which is really, really important to me. So one of the things that we are offering is our next event, and um, it is with um, a friend and colleague of mine, Dr. Amy Palder. And it's titled, um, I Don't Know What I Don't Know. And it is about DEI with the lens of LGBTQ+. And it's about us and how what we know about ourselves and how we communicate with our families and our children um, that we care for in being sensitive to this, this world. So um, this is a little bit different and that we're charging for it um, because she's coming and spending a couple of hours with us. And she's actually going to be offering up her um, email to us to answer questions and things like that post the event. So um, you will hear more about this, but we're very excited about this. I don't see this happening anywhere. And I think this will be a great opportunity for you and your colleagues to learn more um, and to improve our services that we're providing to our families. So please be on the lookout. So um, just as a little bit of a housekeeping, so one, please stay muted. Two, um, we really want you to turn your video on. Um, and as things come up, we're gonna want you to talk and we're gonna want you to chat. And we're gonna want you to um, be part of the poll. So sometimes in these events, people kind of do multitasking or you're eating or you're doing something else and which is great, but we also want to hear from you. And like I said, we're really touching a lot of lives today and we're very excited about Dorothy being here. So please turn your video on, please be interactive with us um, to get the most out of this. So without further ado, let me introduce our wonderful guest. So um, Dorothy Brooks, um, I'm sure many of you know her or you would not have um, know her or know of her, um, but she has been a certified child life specialist for almost 40 years. As her hospital bereavement community education specialist, she's facilitated 48 grief support camps to date, serving nearly 1,500 children and coordinated an annual health education event serving 35,000 children to date, which is just incredible. Recently, she developed child life programming for grief support to be facilitated in her local adult hospital. She is an adjunct, <clears throat> adjunct professor at Loma Linda University with her child life specialist master's program, continually investing in, in those interested in becoming part of the field. So I'm going to turn this over to Dorothy and also to Carissa, who is one of our child life specialists. Um, I will turn my video off and I will be in the background and Alice She, who is our manager, will be in the background kind of helping with um, the behind the scenes and chat messages as well. So Carissa and Dorothy, take it away. Thank you so much, Dee Dee. Um, so I am so excited for today. I had the privilege and the honor of being a student of Dorothy's during my grad school program, as well as being able to work under her for a couple of years. And um, she has so much wisdom, she has so much passion for the field, and, she, and just so much 
long-term experience, being able to see how child life has grown and changed and really transformed. And so I thought her just being able to share her story and her experience throughout these last 39 years um, would be really helpful to all of us to learn about how child life has changed. Um, I know sometimes um, for us, when we're working so hard to grow the field, it just feels so like, what is happening here? <laughs> and it feels like it's taking forever for the field to grow to the capacity that we know and want it to be at. Um, and so I think Dorothy will be able to shed light on really how much the, the field has grown that we don't always get to see every day. So I'm so excited for this. Thank you so much, Dorothy, for being here. Um, I wanted to go ahead and start today with a poll because I wanted to see who else has been a child life specialist for maybe 10, 20 plus years here too. So I'm gonna put up a poll and I would love for everybody to take a couple of seconds or moments um, to answer this so we can kind of find out a little bit more about how many years all of our participants have been working as a child life specialist. And then I think um, Dee Dee or Alice, one of you guys will be able to see the results. So I'm gonna give it a couple more seconds and then one of you guys should be able to share with us some like our trends of how many years people have been working. So cool seeing all the numbers change. There's actually a, a wide range. I'm super impressed to see such diversity in people who are here today. So it looks like as of right now, the majority of our participants are either um, have been working as a child life specialist for zero to five years or 10 to 20 years, which is amazing. Um, and then our next largest group is the five to 10 year ratio. And then we do have 14 people here today who have been in the field for 20 to 30 years. Amazing, thank you for all of your hard work. And we have two people here who have also been working for 30 plus years. So, so cool. Thank you so much for all the hard work that you've done in growing our field. I also want to have this be a space where we can just kind of learn from each other and um, be able to ask Dorothy questions as well. So I want you guys to feel free to share in our chat right now um, so many you know, pressing questions that you have for Dorothy before we get started. And at the very end of the webinar, we'll go through those questions that are listed um, and try to answer as many of them as we can, okay? So feel free to add those in the chat for us to be able to see what your questions are. Okay, so, oops, this keeps happening, I'm so sorry. My first question for Dorothy is, can you just share a little bit with us about your experience and kind of your history of being a child life specialist and just all of your many accomplishments throughout the last um, many years? Certainly. I'm so honored to be here with all of you. It's exciting to be able to share. I'm really grateful because we had a blackout here at the hospital this morning. So I thought I would be in the dark with you, but I'm grateful we're back in business. So yeah, I have to take you way back to 1983. Um, child life is not my first career even. <laughs> my child, I was a high school teacher for several years before I decided to go back to school and get my master's in child development. There was a college that said, come teach, come be with us. So I thought I'd like to do that. And when I was finished, I went to a Quaker school in Pasadena and got my master's in child development. And right when I was done, I heard about child life. And I was here in Loma Linda and I thought, I'm gonna see, they have probably child life. So I checked and they did. And I thought, I'm going to be a volunteer. And I think many of us here may have begun as volunteers in, um, in child life, because we're so excited when you find out about it. Um, so at the same time, I received from my alma mater back in Tennessee, they said, come teach, be, 
teach our nursing students child development, come be the manager of our children's center. So I went back there and interviewed and then I heard there was a position for a child life specialist. Now you're probably thinking, did you do your degree in child life? Did you do your practicum and your internship? So I just take you back, it's 1983. So this would not probably happen today, but I did, I did receive, you know, I went and interviewed and I knew I probably might not get the position because I hadn't taken specific child life classes. I had taken many classes that would be considered child life, but they weren't called that. So I was grateful when they said, you have the position. So the other position back in Tennessee was full time. And I said, no, thank you. And I accepted the position for child life in 1983 as a part time child life specialist. So there were only three of us in the department then, three, two and a half, I was half. And I worked in the evenings. And so a lot of my time was spent preparing children for procedures for the next day, surgeries, all kinds of procedures. So I had a lot of experience at first doing, you know, I had to do a lot of education on my own too. So that was a little bit of a challenge at first, but I was grateful for the opportunity. I loved what I was doing. And even though it was only part-time and I had to work somewhere else part-time, I was very, very happy. So let me tell you what's happened over the years. In 1985, that was an important year for me because I got married to a nurse. So of course I needed a nurse in my life to help me figure all these things out, but that's not why I married him. I love Chris and that was in 85. But the other thing that happened in 85 that was child life related was we began Children's Day. And the three of us had no clue that this would be in a most incredible community event that um, happened in our, and it kept growing and growing. And we just in March had our 37th Children's Day. And it's pretty popular in, we have children coming from schools, children coming from daycare, children coming from parent co-op groups, and they're all coming to learn about the hospital and how it can be a, a place that's a helping place. It doesn't have to be a frightening place. And we have everything from our teddy bear clinic, our stitch station, um, our finger casting, and then many departments join us. We even have snakes in California, the children need to learn how to live safely with snakes. So Children's Day is a big event and we're excited that it continues. And the other thing that happened a few years later was um, in 1993, we opened a new hospital and that's when we became unit based and we added a few more child life specialists. And I have to back up though and say, I became a parent in 88 and I became sensitive to the issues that parents go through when their child's in the hospital because my baby had a stroke at around the time of birth. And I remember thinking, wow, I, I understand a little better now about the fears and what happens for a parent when their baby or when, it, when a mom has to go home without her baby. It's a horrible, horrible thing. So our son is fine. I'm grateful to say they caught, they knew what happened in this hospital. If I'd been at a little country hospital, they may not have known, but he's graduated with honors. He's a graphic design, computer information systems person. And we are so grateful that he's fine. So. Then in 1993, they built a new hospital. So we became unit-based. It was very exciting. And I was even offered to have a full-time position. Um, but I was a parent. In fact, in 1993, when the children's hospital opened, I had my second child. And I decided that was where my focus partly needed to be as a parent. So I didn't go full-time yet. And then in 1996, one of our social workers said to our department, hey, Child Life, um, have you thought of doing a grief camp? And we knew there was a need. We had many children who were siblings to the kids who had died in our hospital and on our oncology unit. And so she said, I know a camp up north in Oregon, they could help you get started. 
And we thought, well, who's going to fund our camp? Yes, we want to do a camp. So we reached out to our administration and they said, yes, you need to do a camp and we will pay for it. And so in 1996, we began Camp Good Grief. And Camp Good Grief has continued until COVID. So I'm excited to say that this November, we plan to return to camp and we have many counselors and campers who are calling me regularly to ask, when do I get to come back to camp? So I'm excited to say we will be continuing that. Um, we continue to grow in our hospital, going to the emergency room, our NICU. As we grew, we needed more staff. So our staff numbers started climbing, which was wonderful. Um, we also had a classroom teacher in 2005, um, two, 2002. And then in 2003, I did accept a full-time position here as the bereavement and community education specialist. So my role here is to coordinate our grief camps, help with the HOPES program, and then participate in all the events that we do with our marketing and foundation. A lot of our community and uh, come in to do things for the children. And so I'm involved with helping to organize and run those events along with marketing and foundation. And in 2005, we began the Child Life Master's Program at Loma Linda University. And that was truly an exciting moment. I was also asked to teach the grief and loss class, which I continue to do. And that's a place where I teach, but I also learn from the students. And I, I know some of you are here today and I'm so grateful like Carissa, I saw at the beginning that Rachel, you're here and I'm sure there's many more that I don't see, but I'm so grateful for the opportunity to have spent time with you while you're getting your master's degree. It's very touching because I learned so much. <laughs> Ooh, gotta stop. Anyway, um, then in 2005, not only did we start a program at Loma Linda, but the district attorney's office came to us and said, hey, would you do a camp for kids who have had a violent death? And they said, we have a way to pay for it if you could just do it. And so we said, okay. So then we began our Camp Good Grief Special Victims Program in 2005. And we love working with our district attorney's office. They're, they, they're so generous. They say, whatever you need. So we've even done a golf camp in Santa Barbara. It's like, no problem golf grief camp. That's interesting, isn't it? But we're so grateful to be connected with so many different resources that recognize the importance of providing this for the children in our community. And then because the campers at camp kept saying to me, you know, we only get to see each other once a year. It's just not enough. So I ventured to ask administration if we could have a teen retreat for the alumni from camp, those who have been to camp at least one year from either special victims or Camp Good Grief. And so we started camp, our teen retreat in 2009. So that brings you up pretty much to date from 83 all the way up to last year, we opened a brand new hospital. So I'm excited that we have grown from one little playroom now to six playrooms and, um, we even have eight units. So we are, we have grown a lot from two and a half to almost 40. So I'm excited to have been a part of, to be a part of this growth time. Yeah, Sorry, that was a long answer. <laughs> well, you've had a, a, like a lot of experience too. So you have so much to share, but how incredible to be able to see your department grow from two and a half specialists to 40 and also now have a, you know, like a master's program as well. So I think that is so exceptional that you were able to be a part of all of those things. So that is very, very cool. Um, our next question for you is what are some of the biggest changes or areas of growth that that you've seen? So you mentioned quite a few, being able to see your department go from two and a half people to 40 people um, and having like a classroom set up, having your department go from one playroom to six playrooms, having the grief camps, with all of those huge changes and transformations that, that you've been able to witness, 
what of those or what ones weren't mentioned were some of like the biggest ones that you really saw child life grow because of those transformations happening? Well, each time we move into a new area of the hospital, it feels like there's a new revelation to the people we're working with. Oh, you can do that. Oh, that's wonderful. So every time we move into a new area, like to go to OR as, you know, to the, emer you know, we go from the units, but to have an outpatient program where all day long child life is taking children into the, into surgery and surgery then begins to recognize, oh, this is making a big difference. And in our NICU, it's making a major difference for the families. So the families are giving feedback to the hospital. And I think that supports what we're doing because then they say, oh, this is very important. So everywhere we go, and right now we're trying to go to the adult units to get a position there, we're getting feedback from the nurses and the social workers saying, we can't do this without you. We need you. So I love that part of growth. I love it. I love that. And what have you seen change in the child life field like itself, just how it's transformed over the last, you know, 40 years, not just your department, but the, the whole field itself? What are some big changes that you've seen? Well, I think when I began, we were, we were known as like, well, you probably have all been hearing about play ladies, these people, and we know play is very important, but these are not terms that really show what we're all about. So I've seen the growth in this area with us being invited to do rounds with physicians and the team to be a part of the interdisciplinary meetings, to ask for our input and to recognize that we're respected for why, where we are in what we're doing to assist the, the medical team. We have doctors now who will not even begin a procedure unless child life is there. So I've watched that growth in our own hospital. And I've heard from those who are at other hospitals that it's happening in other places. I've heard from one of the, our, my students who's gone on that she was told by the ER physic, one of the ER physicians, if we're not doing it right, just stop us. <laughs> Stop us. <laughs> Stop us and let us know what we could do to correct this situation. So I'm excited that um, other people are recognizing that we can provide very important support for the children, their families, and the staff. So that's something I loved watching and learning more about that's happening everywhere, not just here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think it's a good perspective for us to remember that, you know, many years ago, we were just known as like the play ladies or the play people. And now we have doctors and physicians who won't start like a procedure without us being present. And what a huge, you know, change and shift in perspective that is too. So that's great. Um, you mentioned a little bit about working with the DA and hosting like events and things like that. What kind of different alternative settings have you been able to use your child life skills? There's probably many people on here that are curious about how they can use child life outside of the hospital setting or in different ways. What are some ways that you've been able to use those skills in alternative settings? Well, I think grief camp is one of those alternative settings is we were not at the hospital. In fact, many of the children who come to camp have never even been in our hospital. We open our camp up to we've even have out of state campers coming to camp, not often, but sometimes. So using our skills and then training those who are helping us at camp with those skills on how we can assess and work with children and helping them through their loss. And I don't want to say, I don't want to say over their loss, but through the loss mm -hmm. is one of the most important opportunities I have had, but even Children's Day is another opportunity outside of the hospital for us to help children who may never even come to the hospital to know about what goes on if they came to visit somebody else at the hospital. We can make a difference even if they aren't touching this floor in our hospital. We can make a difference in supporting them. Also, I I've heard now that there's a child life specialist in a school. And I love the idea that we can be in settings that we've never even probably thought about. What could I do? But I think now we think of what are my skills and where are their needs to use these skills? 
I think a chiropractic office could be a perfect spot, right? A dental office um, and met any medical office and the, all assessment centers. These are all wonderful places for child life to be involved. So I haven't been able to, you know, be everywhere. I have done a diabetic support group for kids who were not patients and grief support group. Um, those are a little bit outside of the hospital. Um, so that, that's where my experience has been. Okay. And just out of curiosity, and I'm sure so many people have been wondering this too, how did you get like the access or contact to be able to connect with different organizations like the DA or hospital administrators to be able to make your grief camps or um, the camp that was like specific to a violent death, kind of what type of like, like different access did you need or what did you have to do on your end to kind of make some of those things happen that you had the, the hopes and dreams for? Yes, we needed to ask them to provide backgrounds. We needed to know what had happened in, in the loss. So they worked with us, they helped. To, we have a form that we use, but they, they use that form to help us gather the information with their advocates. So it is wonderful to work together. In fact, the DA's office said, this is one of the most positive relationships they have with, with a community group. So they have felt um, that what we're doing is making a major difference and they honored our camp at, um, on a victim's month several years ago because they know that the camp that's happening is changing lives. So um, your question is, how did I have, I connected with them. I asked for certain information. They gather that information and it does take some meetings. I have to meet with them periodically just to make sure that we're, what we're, they're providing is what we're needing to make sure that we have we're able to assess each child coming to camp to make sure it's a good fit for them. So that's one thing. Does that answer that question? Yeah, yeah, no, thank you so much. I also wanted to be able to ask um, the group and the audience as well um, and give a couple of minutes for some people to share. But if you are comfortable, could you um, please put on your video and unmute yourself? And I would love for some people to share what you guys have done to be able to expand your department um, specifically or to be able to expand the field of child life in kind of some similar ways as Dorothy has done or maybe some new things that we haven't heard yet. So I'd love to hear some things that you guys are doing too. We can start. Hello. <laughs> Great, go ahead. Hey there, we're from Advent Health Hospital in Orlando. Um, we actually have a fourth member of our team that all four of us serve the um, children of adult patients consult. Um, and this program specific to children of adult patients was started here by um, one of our other child life specialists who uh, it was about eight years ago. Um, started out as the only one serving all areas of our very large adult hospital. And um, a few years ago, she was able to add um, a second child life specialist for that consult line. And then um, during the Delta COVID surge, uh, it became very clear to administration just how important this role was to serve all these children um, who were going through the loss of a parent and we were able to have two additional child life specialist positions approved to work with children of adult patients through um, COVID-19 funding. So in just um, the last year, we've doubled our program size for adult consults. Wow, that's amazing. And it's cool to see how, you know, something horrible like COVID could make something so great happen with our field. So I'm glad to see that we were able to utilize, you know, tragedy to create something super helpful and super impactful for families during a time when they really needed it. Were you guys gathering data to be able to show proof of the impact of child life services to be able to utilize that funding? 
I'm sorry. <laughs> we were oh. still talking. What what did you ask us? Um, did you need to gather any data to show proof to your hospital and um, the impact that Child Life was having to be able to utilize the COVID funding? So we were starting to gather numbers, um, but really once they heard the stories, the individual stories of how families were being impacted of having support through an ICU stay, an ECMO um, stay, and through the loss of a parent, we didn't have to do any more data collection. They immediately approved those two additional positions. That is so great to hear. I feel like numbers can show a lot, but a patient story can share so much more. So that's awesome that your hospital has been able to see the value of child life. Yeah. Does anybody else have any other experiences or um, different areas that they've been able to grow their department into or the field of child life to? Hi, it's, can you hear me? Yes. <laughs> it's Helen from Montreal, the Montreal Children's Hospital. Um, so my internship project 19 years ago was to create a pilot project for a child life specialist working in day surgery. Um, and the project, the pilot project went super well, and uh, they actually created a position which I did not end up working in that position. Um, and then my colleague who was working in that position took it even a few steps further and created a program, uh, parental presence at induction. Mm -hmm. And what they've done is they support parents going into the OR uh, and while their patient with their child falls asleep. Uh, and also they do more preparation, virtual preparation since COVID hit. Uh, and they've even uh, wrote a research paper on their outcomes and also have now got funding for a second position in that department, which has been really incredible. And I mean, there's more initiatives. We have pet therapy uh, that we run. It was a one day program and now it's a two day program in order to meet the demands of our outpatient clinics since they're getting so much bigger. Um, so we're always trying to find different avenues and ways uh, to be visible and mm -hmm. because we see the impact that we make. That's amazing. Thank you so much for sharing. And you mentioned growing into like the virtual space, which I'm sure we've been able to see more and more throughout these last couple of years. And it also kind of birthed, you know, Heart Connected as well. But have, um, like, is there anybody here who has been able to grow their department to the virtual space th through their hospital? And what has that been like for, um, for you? Hi, I'll Sorry. share. Hello, my name is Erin. I'm from Radio, we're from Radio Children's in San Diego. And um, during the pandemic, um, I've piloted a telemedicine program through Rady Children's. So working with um, the patients of Rady's and outpatient setting and doing one-on-one -on -one and different support groups and art groups for um, supporting patients when they're not in the hospital and providing child life services um, in a different setting. That's awesome. Thank you for sharing, Erin. Um, it's, it's really cool just to hear how we're not only, you know, growing into spaces beyond just the pediatric setting, but growing into adult spaces, going into the virtual space, growing into um, to different outpatient settings to be able to advocate for parent, you know, presence during like, during um, like their anesthesia and, and things like that. But just being able to hear all of the different spaces and ways that we're growing beyond just the pediatric hospital setting um, is really cool. So thank you so much for those that shared. I really appreciate it. So I have a few more questions for you, Dorothy. So when you first started, um, what helped you to be able to stay motivated and patient for the growth of the field? Because obviously we all know, we understand that it feels very slow at times, that our field is slowly growing and slowly gaining um, the, the attention and the, 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 the recognition that it deserves. Um, how did you stay patient through all of that? Well, I also want to thank everybody for sharing. And Erin at Advent Health, I'm going to contact you because we're collecting data too for <laughs> our adult. And we love your story, all of you who shared, Helen and Erin, thank you. So one of the things that helped me is because I love challenges too. And so when I was able to do a support group for the children, we had a support group for parents. And so children from, you know, who had diabetes came with their parents and they didn't have anything to do. 
So it, it was wonderful being able to do a support group for children with diabetes and their siblings. So that was one of the first things I got to do that was kind of pushing out of you know the units and, and then doing a grief group too. I did a grief group for children who had a parent die and had support for leading the parents too while I led the children. So those were things that helped me at the beginning to know. I remember it was very scary doing lectures at first and all the things that we do to educate everybody in the hospital, but those challenges were good. They're push, you know, they just push you a little bit and help you know that you're helping, helping everybody understand a little bit better. And that's going to bless your whole department and all the patients in the future. So that's what I did. Those things. I love that. So you saw a challenge and you weren't scared of it. You saw it like as a way to be able to grow and kind of come above whatever that challenge is. And I think we're all here to do the work of bettering the experience and to better support our patients and families. And so having that perspective as a reminder of those little challenges throughout the years or days is, you know, us working towards being able to reach more families, reach more patients and better and to better serve them. So when you look back on the last 40 years, what are some things that have really helped to sustain you professionally and personally? Because um, it's so incredible that you were able to, you know, remain in the field for this long and what helped you to, to do that? I think of four, four things. First, I am a Christian and my spiritual beliefs really um, provide me with hope for a better future and um, a reunion. I've often thought of, you know, because I believe that we will be reunited with all these kids. And I kept thinking, I wish they were all buried. This is me, you know, thinking, I wish they were all buried in one place. And I just want to be there when they're, you know, when I see them in perfect health again. So that's one thing, the spiritual beliefs, family support. Oh my, my husband has been the most incredible sounding board for me through all these years. And my kids, they learn that, you know, mom doesn't talk about certain things, but mom needs to unload too. So <laughs> going home and sharing is very important. And the team I work with, we, we get together, we support each other when we're having difficult times. So that is very, very important to have a cohesive team that you feel you can, you can just share when it's getting tough for you. And we lift each other up and encourage each other too. We have these things called IAPU, so we can give them a little note that comes in their email when we're recognizing that they have done, gone above and beyond. We need to encourage them. So we do a lot of things to encourage each other. Um, also, my thought process. I remember, you know, after saying goodbye to quite a few patients, I started thinking about the way I approach my work. And I remember thinking, this may be not a long friendship, it may be a short friendship, but every day is important. And sorry, <laughs> I say goodbye to a lot of kids. Mm -hmm. And I've been, I don't have to go to funerals, but I do. And whoa, it's kind of hard. So anyway, but I'm talking about what sustained me. So crying right now is not, <laughs> yeah, I do cry. I cry a lot, <laughs> that sustains me. But at the end of the work day, you know, when I go home, I, I think about, well, maybe I've been helpful today for somebody. Mm -hmm. And that thought process of like, it's going to be a short, has protected me. So I prepare myself for the losses. And I'm just, even though I, I wish that we never had another grief. Oh my, we could just not have another grief. But when I know that we've been an instrument of support for a family, there's nothing like going home and feeling that peace. Mm -hmm. So that's. Thank you so much for sharing, Dorothy. And thank you for your vulnerability too. I've known you as being a very vulnerable person with your words, but also with your like emotions as well. And um, working in grief for so long is heavy and you've gotten to unfortunately witness the death of many, many children and many family members of children. Um, and so I think your ability to always be vulnerable, not only here today, but with your team and with your family has probably been something that has sustained you. It looks like, and sounds like, 
Um, and I wanted to ask you kind of one follow-up question too, because you mentioned that when you come home, your kids know that, you know, mom needs to unload. And I'm sure that we have lots of, you know, people here today who have families at home and they're kind of trying to figure out how can I balance being a mom when I come home or a dad when I come home when I just came from, you know, three grief supports and it was a horrible day at the hospital today. Um, where, when you would come home, would you tell your kids, hey, it was a really hard day or what did it look like for you to be able to create that space for yourself when you come home? Yeah, they, I've been honest with them that sometimes the days are hard. I had a sad day. When they're young, it's just a sad day. When they're getting a little older, I don't, I can't say all the details, but I share it's been a hard day. Um, and they have been so incredibly supportive. I do make, I'm nervous that our oldest son chose not to go in the medical field. And it's because of my stories, but maybe not. I, <laughs> Our other son is in the medical field, so I don't know. Hopefully my stories didn't frighten them too much, <laughs> but I tend to be very honest with my kids and the support I found from them. It's so funny. If we're just sitting watching a program on TV and if an ad comes on that's touching, they would all turn to me because they know I'd cry during that advertisement. So they just look at mom and say, oh, that's so sweet. But I, I think I save up all that sadness and then something just happens and it releases so and they are in touch with their emotions too I'm grateful to say they haven't shut them down because of me but that's that's how I handled that mm -hmm. yeah it sounds like you were a safe space to show that it's okay to release your emotions whether it's the right time or not by being able to release them in a safe space mm -hmm. thank you for sharing Dorothy yeah. Um, when, were there times in your career just kind of reflecting on all of the grief that, that you've experienced and all of the emotion that you've kind of had to bear throughout these last 39 years while supporting families, were there times when you had burnout or you truly felt like you were, you know, going through burnout and what did you do during those times? Well, I recognized that I have to balance my life. So I do a lot of different things outside of the hospital to balance my life. And one thing I can tell you, I don't go see sad movies. I have to know how the movie ends. It has to be happy. I love comedy. I love a lot of, you know, and I love to do events with my family. We love playing games. So I focus on a lot of other activities. So I, I don't talk about work at that time and I be able to separate that and, and I have friendships and fa other family members that I love spending time with. We have, we do a lot together that has nothing to do with work. And yet I feel the support for my extended family for what I do. So I think that's how I've been able to do it to make sure that I'm trying to balance my life. And there are times when I go home and I know I can't do a thing. I just need to go to bed. After grief camp, my husband is so sweet. He has the sheets changed on the bed. He said, get ready for bed. You're going to sleep right now after grief camp. So I have, I have wonderful support. So that also, I have to say, it's not just me. I have a, lo a lovely team around me that makes a difference. Mm -hmm. And support is so important. And you also mentioned balance and it sounds like your balance is super intentional in that, um, you know, after a hard day, you may not necessarily seek out watching a sad movie to release the emotions because you allowed yourself to release them at work or in the car, like the, like the drive home or um, when it was, you know, currently happening or right after it had happened. And then you're able to then find the intentional balance of watching a comedy or doing something fun to just give your brain a break. Um, and so I love that you touched on like the, just the, 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 like the breakdown of being able to find a balance and not only just get sucked into finding the release of feeling sad or feeling upset. I think that's super important too. What do you wish you could tell your younger child life self? And we also had someone ask a question as well of what do you wish that you knew when you got certified? So they're kind of both related, but how would you answer this question? Okay, I'll answer both those questions. Well, first of all, I didn't feel like a legitimate child life specialist because I hadn't come through a child life program. 
So I think what I would say is, um, hey, you're going to be okay, Dorothy. It's okay. You are motivated to learn, and um, and you've taken many classes that are like child life classes. So that's one thing I'd say to encourage myself then, because there's so much we learn in our classes that I had to kind of learn on my own, and that's a blessing. But there's also a lot that we learn at work every day. So mm -hmm. that's one thing I'd like to say to myself, a younger self, is you're going to be okay. You're going to get this stuff. It's going to, it's going to make sense one of these days. So that's what I'd say. And then the other question that somebody asked, um, oh, about being certified. Now, when, well, when I started, the Child Life Council had just begun. And so they were at their beginning stages. So we had joined the Association for the Care of Children's Health. That was our official organization until Child Life Council got started. That was their first name, Child Life Council. And the first, I, I hate to say this, but the first time that I was um, certified, we just had to turn in all the things that we were doing and then they certified us. Well, that didn't last, did it? Then we had to take <laughs> an exam for that. But I think, you know, that's the hard part, isn't it? That we need to prove you know, and, we, and the exam has improved. I've even helped with some questions because when they first started, we weren't sure that it was really measuring um, what we are as child life specialists, but it has improved over the years. So I'm grateful to say that. But I do think, um, I do know this, that even if you are not certified, that does not mean that you are not a great child life specialist. Certification helps, but it doesn't mean that you're not a great child life specialist. So I just wanted to put that out there that I have met incredible child life specialists who are not certified. And, and then there are many who are. So I don't think it means that you can't make it. Um, it is nice when you can be certified, but if you are not, it doesn't mean that you're not a great child life specialist. Thank you for sharing that, Dorothy. I'm sure yeah. that that there's some people here today that needed to hear that. So thank you for sharing. Um, what are some words of wisdom that you can share with all of us? You already have shared so much, but I, like if there's one thing that you could share um, with us to be able to just kind of support um, like all of us here as if we were like your students. Cause I feel like throughout my years as a graduate student, I got to learn so much from you. And if we were all like your student here today, what's kind of something that you would just share with us to help to support us and to mentor us? Okay, one thing I, I know I say every year, so you may remember this, but if you ever get to the places of child life specials where you think you figured it all out, well, <laughs> that's the most dangerous place to be because we are learners. We learn every day. We learn from patients. We learn from other staff members. We learn from parents. We learn from each other. And so if you think you figured it out, if I see somebody who's acting really overconfident, that makes me really nervous because I think child life is all about learning, learning every single day. Just last week, I learned something from a chaplain that I thought was beautiful. A family was at the bedside of a patient that was dying and they were very, very quiet. And the fellow and I, we were outside giving them their privacy and the chaplain went in and the gentleman was able to talk a little bit. He had him read a few of his favorite verses in the Bible. But then the chaplain, because we read this in his note, he turned to the family who was very quiet and said, I think he might enjoy hearing your chatter as you talk among yourselves. He didn't have a lot of energy to interact with his family as he was dying. But the idea of he's going to benefit from hearing you talk with each other. And it was a beautiful, gentle encouragement for the family to relax and share with each other. And I thought, wow, that was such a great idea. So I'm learning all of the time from other people. If we listen and we keep our minds open to what we're seeing, there are so many um, ways that we can grow and I'm looking each day for a way to grow and to learn and I learn from students I learn from people who have nothing to do with child life but they have an idea or they're doing something that I think could make a difference 
for me to use when I'm working with families. So that's the most important thing that I think I can say right now. Keep learning. Keep I love that. The best teachers are those that are still learning every day. So I totally agree with that. I think that's very wise words. Thank you, Dorothy. Um, do you have any specific hopes of um, things that you want to see for the growth of child life or things that you want to do within your department still before you do retire? What are kind of some of your hopes and dreams of things you hope to see in the field itself, but also your department? Well, like Advent Health, we want child life up on the adult units because during COVID, we were very, very busy helping. And that's one reason I was able to even come back to work because I was on leave because camp was not happening. So came, I came back and started helping on the adult units and it's very clear that we are needed there. So my dream would be that a position or more might be approved for us to continue helping the children and the grandchildren of our adult patients. So that's one of my dreams. I also think that, you know, I, I'm just excited about Hearts Connected. I'm excited about what some pioneers in our field are doing. I think of Belinda Hammond, who's done a lot to increase this, to do things outside of the hospital setting. If we mm -hmm. are ever licensed, it's because of um, what, what Colleen Sherry is doing to make that possible for us to be licensed. So I'm impressed with the people who are willing to push the parameters and to work extra hard to show what child life is capable of doing. And of course, we all didn't get into this for the money, right? But I do think one of the things that, that draws child people to child life is the, the um, satisfaction of what we're able to do to help families every day. And I think when we expand that to outside of the hospital setting, we're making a difference for our world in so many ways. And I'm excited to hear of all the different ways people are doing that. I've been in a hospital this whole time, but I maybe am not as brave as some people going outside of the hospital. So I'm excited to hear about those of you who are doing things outside in the new setting. Great. So I wanna make sure that we have, you know, about five or 10 minutes to be able to have an open dialogue with Dorothy. We did have a lot of questions submitted in our chat. So I'm gonna go through those and pick out a couple to ask Dorothy, but I wanna um, set aside some time right now for you to be able to turn your video and your mic on and to ask Dorothy some questions live. So go ahead. I'll start. I always have a question. So I think one of our biggest, I'm gonna call it a problem because it's my biggest marketing concern is that child life is not a household name. So in all the work that Hearts Connected and everybody that works for me and, and the other pioneers in, in the industry that are doing community-based child life, what suggestions do you have as to how to communicate in layman's terms what we do? I guess for me is whenever I see a need and somebody is sharing a need and I'm thinking, oh, we can help with that. So that's one thing I want to be available. And if I feel it's beyond my scope, I need to put them in touch with who can help them. But to be a household name means that we're answering the phone. We're talking to people who are calling saying, I need help. Whenever we have an opportunity to do a lecture outside of this setting to help expand people's minds and that's happening to me this weekend at my church. So wherever we have it, when we have a chance to go outside of where we're working to help other people understand and then they tell somebody else. And then I think that's one of the things I feel we can do um, that wouldn't take a lot of extra work, but just to be ready and be available. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. I had someone ask me, um, privately 
about your experience in working with the DA. And they were wondering, have you heard of child life specialists working in courtrooms? And were you ever like invited to do any type of work like that? You know, they have vict victims advocates that are doing that. And they even have dogs that are trained to help with the children. And they bring those dogs to camp. Um, so I haven't been invited just because the victim's advocates are trained specifically for court. But if they didn't have victim's advocates, I, I'm sure they might invite, they, they're very open to what we do. So if they didn't have that, maybe, maybe we could go into that place, but they do have specific roles for those who are help children at, at the court. Awesome, thank you for answering that question. Does anybody else have any other live questions for Dorothy that they would like to ask? All right, well, Dorothy, we are so, so, so grateful for your time today and being able to share just your experience, your wisdom, and all the things that you've been able to witness in the field of child life throughout the last 40 years. And um, you always help to, to inspire me. And I hope that, you know, many of like the people who are able to be here today are also feeling super inspired by you and what you've done for the field and your department. Um, for everybody who is still on a uh, message, an email will um, be sent to you and that will include a um, post survey. You have to have the post survey completed to be able to receive um, your PDU certificate and we'll send that to you shortly after the post survey is done. Our um, webinar series, Prioritizing Me in Mental Health, has also been a free webinar series, um, but we, we are also a donation-based um, webinar series right now. So if you would like to donate um, to Hearts Connected, 100% of our proceeds go towards being able to support a family or a child being able to receive our services. So our um, Venmo QR code is here. And again, we are so thankful for all of those who were able to be here today. And thank you so much, Dorothy, again. Thank you. Thank you, Carissa, Dee Dee, Alice, all of you for inviting me. And thank you all for being together with me today. It's been fun. Awesome. Thank you so much, Dorothy. Have a great rest.